Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen patrick Adro. I am your host. You can learn more about who I am and what I do by visiting my website, joyfulvegan.com. Hi, everyone. I hope you are doing fabulously well. We are back from France. We're going to talk about France today. I know it's shocking to hear me talk about a country other than Italy. (laughs) I feel like we've done that a lot. But here I am. As you know, we went to the Dordogne. We went to the Loire Valley. We started off in Paris and we ended in Bordeaux. This was part of our French countryside trip, our joyful vegan French countryside trip. And I have lots to say about it, but I wanted to start off with Bordeaux. We ended in Bordeaux. The trip itself does not include Bordeaux in terms of activities. The trip itself is filled with activities and time in the Dordogne, especially, and also a bit of the Loire. And I have an announcement to make about that. I'll save it for the end. But all that's to say is because we spent so much time in Bordeaux on our own that wasn't part of a joyful vegan trip, I wanted to share with you some of our vegan finds there. Because if you come on a joyful vegan trip, I can tell you all about the Dordogne, and I will, and I will, but you're obviously, you don't have to think about anything. We take care of everything. So I can give you tips for how to eat in the Dordogne, but I want to first focus on on Bordeaux, especially because it's a city that is world-renowned. Many people go there, and I think it's probably a place that you will find yourself in perhaps sooner than you would find yourself in the Dordogne. One of the reasons we run trips, vegan trips, is because there are certain places around the world, as much as you implement all of the tips and advice and strategies I give you for getting what you need, where being vegan, wherever you are, you know, speaking up for yourself, being unapologetic, et cetera, et cetera, there are places around the world where it's harder to find good plant-based food, good vegan food. You can get by in most places, but we really want to celebrate the fact that vegans should not in any way experience deprivation because they don't want to hurt animals or they want to eat healthfully. And so that's why we run Joyful Vegan Trips. I do them with my partners, World Vegan Travel, Bridie and Seb, who you'll hear me talk about and you've heard me talk about before. And the truth is, tip from the hip, whenever you're in a city, it's going to be a lot easier to find a variety of food that's edible for vegans versus going into the countryside. And that's what's so exciting about doing the Dordogne, French countryside. We did the Loire as well. And that's why we do other places as well, because this is not a vegan-friendly region at all. At all. In fact, I think there was more (laughs) celebration of vegan food and vegans in the Dordogne than ever before in the history of the Dordogne. I'm just going to say it. I just said it. I just said it. So we'll, we'll come back to the Dordogne, but let's focus on Bordeaux. So our visit to Bordeaux, as I said, ended, it's where our French countryside trip ended. So all of our travelers, we escort all of our travelers from the Dordogne to Bordeaux train station. Some people extend their time in Bordeaux. Some people went on to Paris to spend some more time. Some People start making their way back home immediately. So we bring travelers either to the train station or to the airport and everyone goes off on their way and we say goodbye there. However, David and I and Brady and Seb, we decided to stay a few extra days. Well, number one, we had never spent any time in Bordeaux before and we were looking forward to it. Number two, because my husband is a travel hacker and we rely on the awards flights that he can get uh, based on the miles we have, the points we have, he was able to find a flight leaving from Paris, so we would still have to make our way back to Paris from Bordeaux, four days after the trip ended. The only reason that caused me a bit of anxiety is because I had a cooking demo that I was teaching the day after we were arriving home. (laughs) So I knew I was going to have to shop and prep and all of it before, you know, within 24 hours, because I had to turn around and, and head up to Sacramento for a cooking demo, but also because I tend to want to get home after our group trips. Sometimes the four of us 
you know, stay a few days somewhere or we go somewhere. It's getting harder with Bridie and Seb now having World Vegan Travel as their official business. They're scouting or running trips all the time now. And so we don't have as much opportunity to go and rent an Airbnb in, I don't know, Slovenia like we used to be able to do. But, uh, but we try to do that. And yet four or five days after a trip where we've been gone already three weeks, I was a little reluctant, but I was embracing it because that's just the way it was. And, you know, there are worse things in the world than having to spend four days in Bordeaux. (laughs) So we had plans to have four nights, spend four nights in Bordeaux. And Bridie and Seb were going to be with us, I think, most of the time, three out of those four nights. But because they had to make some changes to their plans, in, in the end, they were going to be there for only one night. And then they were heading off to Alsace, where they had to do some final scouting, final meetings, final food checks before our Alsace trip, which is coming up in December of 2023, which there are two spots left for if you'd like to join us. So in the end, David and I were going to be there four nights, five days, and Bridie and Seb were at least going to be able to be there with us for about two days, maybe a day and a half in the end, and then one night. So we arrived and it was a bit of a rocky start. This is one of those experiences where I did not love Bordeaux when I first arrived, but I will spoiler alert, in the end, (laughs) I did really wind up liking the city. I can't say I fell in love with it, but I did wind up really liking it and appreciating it. And I'll share more about why I did. The, The bad foot we got off on really was related to just silly things. Nothing, there was nothing tragic or anything, but we didn't know that the Rugby World Cup was being held there and in France and in other parts of France, but in Bordeaux was the Rugby World Cup. So it was just overrun with people. And that meant that once we said goodbye to our travelers at the train station, it took about 30 minutes for us to get an Uber. And, you know, we're tired and we're hungry and it's hot and we just want to get to our apartment and just kind of put all our stuff down and then go eat. And in fact, we had all agreed that when we got back to the apartment, After we ate, we were just going to chill. We needed to chill. We had spent, you know, a long two weeks with, uh, you know, prepping for and then hosting our trip. Wonderful people, wonderful trip, and it's pretty intense. And we all needed to just chill. So it took 30 minutes for us to get an Uber. I'll spare you the details. And we finally arrived at our short-term apartment rental We had secured several months before. When the four of us travel together, we tend to do rentals as opposed to hotels because then the four of us can stay in the same place. And of course, we get two bathrooms, two bedrooms. And that was the case with this apartment. Now, it wasn't an Airbnb. It was a Marriott Homes and Villas, which is apparently Marriott getting in on the Airbnb game. And we trust Marriott as a brand. David's, you know, a gold member because of just, again, points and travel hacking. And so we thought, okay, and we saw the listing and we always look very carefully at the listings beforehand. And, you know, we booked it several months earlier and the listing looked lovely. And it was actually marketed as a beautiful Bordeaux apartment. That's how it was marketed. And we get there and it was absolutely horrific. Horrific. (laughs) The listing egregiously misrepresented this place. And this has never happened to us before. We've, we're we really good at choosing places that we can tell from listings and reviews that are going to be good. And it was awful. Dirty furniture, broken windows, peeling paint, and <laughs> probably worst of all, one toilet, which for the four of us, four vegans, not going to happen, not happening. And so it was just everything opposite of what the listing had shown, indicated, and and even, including the one toilet. So it was really misrepresented. So we go have lunch, and I'm going to talk about lunch because that's the, the most important part of this episode. But long story short, we... <laughs> We Well, actually, as we're walking to lunch, I decided to speak up because Bridie and Seb were only staying one night and David is the most agreeable person on the planet. Bridie also, we all recognized how bad this place was, but Bridie in her Bridie way just said, well, we'll make the most of it. And I thought, "Mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no, I'm not staying here for four nights. I'm not staying here for four nights. It was awful. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I have pictures if you really want to see. So unfortunately, we spent hours after lunch, because on the way to lunch, I, I spoke up and I said, I know this is going to throw a wrench in our plans, 
but I'm not staying there. I'm not paying for this place. This is nothing like it said it was. It's dirty. I don't even want to sit. I didn't even want to sit on the furniture. It was, it was awful. And so I said, I know this is going to be wrong. And they, you know, everyone was, you know, first we had lunch and then we went back and we spent hours, everybody, everybody pitched in and spent hours kind of figuring out what we needed to do to get out of this place, to get our money back, to, you know, take documentation and photos and videos of everything we saw. And actually what was interesting is that this place was no longer listed on Marriott's Homes and Villas website, probably because it did not, live up to the standards and somehow it got removed, but nobody told us it was removed. And so when we went to go find it to just prove that what we're seeing is different than what the listing said, it was gone. The listing was gone. But David, clever clot that he is, he found a cached version on you know his Chrome um, browser and we were able to use that and we still have that for documentation purposes. But we had to spend hours dealing with this and it was just not what we wanted. We all wanted to just relax. And there was no air conditioning and Bordeaux was experiencing a hot spell apparently like they had never experienced before. So it was just one thing after another. And then once, you know, once we got there, put our stuff down and we dealt with all of the apartment stuff later and we left to go get something to eat, we were heading to a restaurant. Okay, now here we go talking about the food that Seb was really excited to go to because it had a vegan poutine. What is poutine? I will tell you. The thing is, <laughs> when we got there, so this is after seeing the apartment, after waiting so long for the Uber, sweating, just being tired, we get there, they had just closed the kitchen. Just closed the kitchen. So I was a bit hangry. I was a bit cranky. We looked on Google Maps for other options. And again, everything was overrun, just rugby enthusiasts everywhere. And we did find an awesome pizza place just a couple blocks away that accommodated us, which was quite amazing. There was a huge crowd and every table was filled, but there was one table opening up inside and we took it. Now I'm going to talk about pizza a little bit more because I have lots more to say about pizza. <laughs> um, and I don't have the name of the place that we ate at initially. It was good. I don't, it wasn't anything I'd write home about. But my point that I want to make kind of off the bat, and I'm going to say it more later, and I've said this before in many other episodes, is ordering a marinara pizza at an authentic pizzeria, and this place was a pizzeria, it was a proper pizzeria, is perfectly normal in Europe, will not raise any eyebrows, obviously in Italy, but also in other cities, because if it's an authentic pizzeria, it's run by Italians, it's run by people who know that marinara pizza was the original pizza, and there is nothing weird or vegan specific about asking for pizza marinara. It is tomato sauce, garlic, oregano, olive oil, on a beautiful crust. That's it. You know, you can add extra toppings, as we did with some basil, roasted red peppers, extra garlic, olives, red onions, whatever it is you want. But the point is, it's not strange at all. So I knew when we saw that there was a pizza place and the, and the pictures looked really good, we would get a good, we would get a good deal. And we did. It was good. It was good pizza. But I'll have more to say about pizza a little later on. So now I'm going to skip ahead to our visit to Au Nouveau Monde, which is where Seb had been wanting to go that has the vegan poutine. So <laughs> we did get to go there that night. No, I think it was the next night because we ordered in that night. But I want to talk about poutine because apparently it's a thing. <laughs> so the reason why Au Nouveau Monde, and I'm going to have the names of all of these restaurants on my website at joyfulvegan.com, serves poutine in the first place is because it is a pub that features food from Quebec. It was a Quebecois pub. And so poutine being a thing in Quebec, in Ontario, in Ottawa, where Seb grew up, who grew up eating poutine, it's a thing. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the first time I had poutine was pretty recently, and it was with Seb and Brady. We went up to British Columbia. They live in Squamish near Whistler, and we went up there to visit them. We had been meaning to go visit them since they moved basically to the West Coast, which is awesome because we're all in the same time zone and not far from each other from Bangkok. They moved from Bangkok. 
it was they did it they moved in 2019 the end of 2019 early 2020 right when lockdown happened and so we had been wanting to get up there and see their place and see squamish we had never been there before for years and we hadn't been able to because of covid and then we started running our trips together again luckily as things started opening up by 2022 so this was the first time we were able to get up to squamish and they picked us up from Victor, uh, from uh, Vancouver and on the way up we had to charge the Tesla and on the way up we stopped at a chain Canadian fast food chain place that specializes in grilled cheese and poutine and they serve vegan poutine so some of you who follow me on social media would have seen me having poutine for the first time because I had no idea what poutine was Seb's talked about poutine, but I kind of drown it out whenever he talks. I'm kidding. I, he talked about poutine, <laughs> and he gets very excited about this thing. I was like, what, it, what, it, what, is this, what is this poutine of which you speak? So I was open to try poutine, obviously vegan, because I'm not going to have non-vegan, because Seb was there, because you know he's from Ontario. This is a thing that they serve there. And so I was like, fine, I'll try it. I can't say it sounded appealing to me or appetizing at all. So if you don't know what poutine is, poutine is basically French fries that is covered with gravy and cheese curds. Now, if you love poutine and I am, you know, I am not enthusiastic about it, please do not judge me. Okay. Please don't judge me. I have plenty of Canadian friends who do not like poutine friends who are from Ontario who do not look like poutine and I just happen to be an American who doesn't like poutine so I don't understand why you'd cover a perfectly good plate of fries with curds and gravy I don't understand it so as we were trying it and there's you know a social media post of me actually trying it for the first time I realized it kind of actually brought back this wave of memory that growing up in New Jersey I did have French fries with gravy at diners in New Jersey. So I put this out on social media to my followers and I was like, tell me if I'm wrong because I'm now this is kind of bringing back memories of me having gravy with French fries. And apparently it's a thing. People had to remind me. It's been a long time, long time that there is a dish. This is called they're called disco fries because apparently I don't know, people from discos would come in the 70s and 80s to diners in New Jersey and have fries with gravy. I don't know. I don't know why it's called disco fries. That's, you know, the that's the, I'm sure, apocryphal story about it. But the point is, I, I had had French fries with gravy, which was kind of crazy. Now, what I remembered and remember is that I don't think the gravy was poured over the fries. I think it was like a dipping option because I don't pour anything on my fries. It's not just a vegan thing. Like I just am one of those people who very delicately dips my fries in ketchup. I don't like a ton of it, a little bit. Don't put ketchup all over my fries. No, and don't put cheese on my fries even. Same thing. Just keep it simple. Keep it simple. So I'll dip it in the ketchup. And I think that's what it was in New Jersey. I just dipped it in the gravy so that was kind of fun kind of realized all right had these things had these disco fries there weren't curds on my french fries <laughs> but that's what a poutine is and so apparently poutine goes back to also in the 1950s i say also you know this poutine doesn't go back to like the 1700s it goes back to like the 1950s also kind of small town diners also kind of you know that kind of food, you know, obviously comfort food, late night, late night food. And apparently it gained popularity across uh, Canada, especially still in Quebec in that region. And so it's all about comfort food. It's all about this kind of hearty comfort food, especially in a place that gets very cold. So I get it, but I don't get it. And so I had poutine and when we had it at this place called Meltwich, which if you're Canadian, you probably know Meltwich because they had a bunch of vegan options. They had like Beyond Burgers and they had this vegan poutine. So we had it there. I can't say I was impressed. I can't say I was impressed. So fine, okay, I tried it, I get it. But Seb was intent on emphasizing that what we had at Meltwich was not really a proper, good, really fabulous poutine. Fine, fine, fine. 
So he was excited to bring us to, well, I think he was, he was going to go anyway. He didn't care if we went, to be honest. So he was excited to go to this Quebecois pub in Bordeaux called Au Nouveau Monde and get some vegan poutine. And so we went, of course, we're not going to have him go by himself to do this. And everybody got the poutine. I cannot say it looked attractive, appealing, appetizing. I can't, I can't, I won't. I won't. But they all got it. They were very happy. But Seb also said, because I looked at it, I'm like, okay, I'll try a little French fry and a little gravy. He said, no, again, it's good, fine, it's decadent, not poutine. So I apparently I still haven't had what a proper poutine is. I guess I'll try it again. But I had a tofu burger and I was very happy. And the point is, whether you go to Au Nouveau Monde and you get the poutine or you get anything else, you will find lots of vegan options there. So there's a to there's a tofu burger. They had a patty kind of burger, like a house-made vegan burger. But I love tofu. And so they had a really good tofu burger with some good old-fashioned fries that I dipped in some ketchup. Lovely. Not amazing. Not the most amazing french fries I've ever had. But the, the fact that there were so many vegan options on the menu, I would highly recommend going to Au Nouveau Monde. In fact, one of our couples who had traveled with us, this is their second trip with us, they had come to Alsace with us several years ago, and then they were with us in the French countryside the day we all, when we got there the day before and found out that the kitchen was closed, they had just arrived in an Uber because that was where they were heading as well. Uh, and in the end, they couldn't go either because the kitchen had just closed. So I don't know what they wound up doing, but there were lots of other vegan options in the city. And we will talk about more of those in a moment. In, in fact, right now. So <laughs> when we left the apartment, we finally got out of there and we went to our hotel, a new hotel, a different hotel, a different accommodations. And we had two different rooms but we were adjoining, so that was kind of fun. So we each had our own bathroom. We each had our own room, but we had an adjoining door. And they were there for two nights. So that night, we were just all pooped, and we did not want to go out anywhere. We were happy to be in air conditioning, to be honest. And Seb ordered Uber Eats delivery to our hotel from a place called Outfry. I'm reading the whole thing. It says Outfry Korean Fried Chicken by Taster. And they had crazy vegan options. So it's like this Korean fried chicken place, which was already like, okay. And they had vegan tenders, burgers, waffle, fr well, waffle fries, onion rings, coleslaw, wings, like wings with like, I think it was barbecue sauce or a um, buffalo sauce. And it was really good. It was like really good. So that's a good option to have in your back pocket if you're looking for something really inexpensive, casual, and fast. I don't know if they have a brick and mortar place because we ordered from Uber Eats, but this name will also be included on the website at joyfulvegan.com on the show notes for today's episode. Okay, so no problem finding food. So far, we hadn't been to a vegan-only restaurant. And in Bordeaux, there are two vegan-only restaurants. And we went to one of them for lunch the next day. So our plan for the next day was to go up to Saint-Emilion. We'll talk about that in a moment. And have lunch first at a vegan restaurant in Bordeaux called Monkey Mood. So if you search for vegan in Bordeaux, it's going to be one of the first places that come up. So this might not be a surprise to you. But we went there. It has an Indonesian theme. It's located in the Saint-Michel district. So it wasn't far from where we were staying at that apartment. So I did get some PTSD when we had to go back to the neighborhood. <laughs> we had to go back to the neighborhood after having left it because of that apartment. But it was really a lovely place. I kept wanting to go back there because I just enjoyed the food so much. And we never did get to go back there, but I highly recommend Monkey Mood. It was just fantastic. So they have hamburgers, they have rice-based dishes, a lot of Indonesian food. They had gado gado, they had a jackfruit burger, they had a tofu satay, they had tempeh, of course, being Indonesian. And the dish that I had had this uh, vegan fried egg on top of it. So this uh, nasi goreng, it was really, really good. This, the The dish that I had was rice and vegetables and a salad underneath it. And it was just light and fresh and colorful and delicious. We didn't have dessert because we were pressed for time. We really needed to get out there, get out of there and get to the train station to head up to saint -Emilion. But I can't recommend this place highly enough. Really enjoyed it. This, I don't know if all the servers spoke English, but our server did. She was very kind to speak both French and English because Brady and Seb speak French. I do not David speaks a little bit, but she spoke English. All of us speak English. So she was very kind to do that and uh, really loved it. Monkey mood. So after 
we headed up to the train station and we went up to Saint-Emilion. Now, I have to talk about Saint-Emilion. I have to talk about wine a little bit because we're in Bordeaux. It's the reason it is one of the most popular regions of France because it has you know, world-renowned wines and chateau in this region, especially if you are into this particular kind of wine. Now, I am not a big Bordeaux fan. I don't tend to drink big big Bordeaux, these big, big wines, tanniny kind of meaty wines. I just don't tend to like them. You could say that some of it maybe is because of my palate, because, you know, this wine tends to be associated with big, rich kind of animal product meals and I don't eat that but I'm also just such a California wine drinker <laughs> that that it's really hard to go from a California Zin to something like a Bordeaux but we have been exploring more and more European wines I've talked about this a little bit on episodes about Italy I do really love Italian wines there are some French wines I really like but I'm not a huge French wine drinker, but we have been exploring more. And so as part of our studies, we did drink a number of wines from the left bank and a number of wines from the right bank. And I just am really glad I have a better understanding of what that even means. Because when we started off, I had no idea what the difference was between the left bank and the right bank. And it's just helpful to know because there's distinctive characteristics whether you're on the left side of the Garonne River or the right side, which is crazy that there's such a huge difference in the terroir from just one side of the river to the other. Not very uncommon to find a lot of these kinds of stories, especially in uh, on European soils. And so you have a difference in the grape varietals and the winemaking styles, depending on where you are in Bordeaux. So the left bank of Bordeaux, and I had a tip from a course we took, and it was like one of the best things I took away from this course, is the left bank. It's on the left bank of uh, the west of the Garonne River. Okay. And it's famous for its gravelly soils, which are really well suited for Cab uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So Cab Cabernet Sauvignon, cabs, right? The left bank, if you if you hold up an L using your pointy finger and your thumb, you get an L. If you kind of bend your pointy finger a little bit, that's really a C. It makes a C. That's how I remember that left bank is cab. Tip from the hip. You can use that anytime, but it's been really helpful. <laughs> it's been really helpful. So cab sov is uh, dominant in the left bank and and they're known for their structure and their tannins. I don't love cabs. I'll drink them if I have to, but I don't love cabs. The regions, the towns, the appellations that you're going to find up there are Poyac, Margot, Saint-Julien. Those are the appellations you're going to find up there. Madoc, Grave, that's what you're going to find. On the right bank, which is where we went, which is where saint emilion is, it's on the east side of the Garonne River and the Dordogne River. It's soils different. The soil is just different. It's crazy. There's more clay. There's more limestone. And that is more suitable to Merlot and Cab Franc. So Cabernet Franc and Merlot, especially Merlot. And so they have a bit, they're a bit softer, fruitier. You can drink them a little early. You know, the Cab Sauvs, you want to age. You could age for 50 years or 100 years. I mean, you can age this forever. But with the Merlots, you can drink them a lot earlier. So Saint-Emilion, Pomerol, those are two of the kind of most well-known towns and appellations. And that's where we went. We went to Saint-Emilion. And it is absolutely worth going to, even if you're not into wine, even if you're not into Bordeaux wine. It is an absolutely beautiful place. It is medieval. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's absolutely picturesque. And I do happen to prefer Merlot. So it was fitting that we went to Saint-Emilion because we really did enjoy the wines we were tasting there. We went to a couple wine tastings. Now, most places require a reservation. We didn't make any reservations because things were a little uncertain about Brighty and Seb's schedule. So we didn't want to make a reservation that we couldn't get a refund for if we wound up not going. So we just decided to wing it. And I'm so glad we did just cobblestone streets and stone buildings and charming cafes and boutiques and just really adorable. There's a church that is carved into the limestone, uh, Eglise Monolith. And it is absolutely gorgeous. I think oh, 11th century, I think. And beautiful place. So definitely go there. 
and 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 enjoy it. We went to a wine tasting or two, and then we wound up at a bar, a wine bar, before we were hitting the train again. And we weren't going to eat a meal there, but we decided we wanted a little snack while we were having some wine. And of course, when you look at a menu for any, especially big touristy place, it's going to be all cheese and it's France, it's going to be cheese. And so they had a plate that we thought we could just kind of modify and our server was very happy to do it. So he was very happy to take off the cheese. I think there were two different cheeses on there. We said, get rid of that cheese and keep everything else. And he did. And so we had cherry tomatoes and cucumbers and nuts and celery and a gorgeous baguette. It really is true. The baguette, the bread, the bread in France. It's one thing I love about France. And, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a playful joke with me and my friends and Brady and Seb and David that I'm not a Francophile. I mean, I say it's playful. It's not a joke. I'm not a Francophile, (laughs) but I'm always keen on discovering new things and being wrong and having new experiences. And of course, finding things that I do appreciate about a place that I might not be head over heels in love with, but appreciate. And I will say, and you know how much I love me, my Italy, you know, when we go to Tuscany, there's a thing about Tuscan bread and Umbrian bread. They don't use salt. There's a reason for it. There's a historical reason. I'll tell you another time. But it's just not the best bread. There's a million other things that are fantastic about Tuscan cuisine and Umbrian cuisine. And you can listen to podcast episodes about that. I have a four-part series on Italian cuisine in the different regions. But when it comes to the bread, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. there's other breads that are really good in Italy, in different regions of Italy. You've got your focaccia, you've got your ciabatta, you've got other breads. But as far as just a good bread to just you know, peel off the, the the heel of that bread and have it with some hummus or tomatoes or oil or what have you. In France, yes. In, in Tuscany, no. So the baguette was just amazing and fantastic. So we really enjoyed a nice little snack and we had a lovely day. So do go to saint Mignon and ask for what you want when you're at a, uh, a wine bar and you just want some snackies and you don't want any animal products. Now I want to say that we did not have a car. Again, we just didn't want this extra expense and we weren't quite sure what we were going to be doing. There were some moving pieces in our in our plan making, but unsurprisingly, the train system in France, in Europe in general, is amazing. And when you are going to these towns like Saint-Emilion, you can just take the train. And so that's what we did. From Bordeaux, we took the train to Saint-Emignon. And Saint-Emignon just happens to be one of these towns where you just walk from the train station up to town and you're in the boutiques, you're in the churches, you're in the the wine tasting rooms. Now, if we wanted to go to specific chateaux and estates or drive around from estate to estate, we would have needed a car. In the end, you know, it was six of one, half dozen of the other for us. We we do want to go back to that region and have a car because we wanted to go to Montaigne's tower. Montaigne's estate was burned down not far from there. And there's still a tower where we were going to go visit that. And to be honest, it would be really nice to kind of drive more around the left bank and right banks. But we were fine not doing that. But just so you know, if you want to drive around a bit more, have a car. But if you're just looking to spend some time in Bordeaux and then just go to, you know, one or two towns, either on the left bank or right bank, you do not need a car. You can just rely on the train system. In Bordeaux itself, same thing. It's a city. You do not need a car at all. And the tram in the city is fantastic. It's the best way to navigate the city. Sometimes we took Ubers for different reasons. We had luggage with us. It was just easier to just take an Uber. But honestly, when we were just getting around the city from place to place, the trams are clean. The plans, trams are inexpensive. They're reliable and really convenient. We just took the trams. So highly recommend the trams. Now, after saint mignon the four of us took the train back to Bordeaux. That's the night we went to Unovo Monde and then had the poutine. And we had a lovely night walking around Bordeaux together. And then we said our goodbyes to Bridie and Seb until we see them again in December for Alsace. And there, as I said, there are two spots left for the Alsace trip. It's a lovely trip. It is Christmas market magic. And there's just no other place like this. It has such a unique history, having gone back and forth between France and Germany for so long. We go into the Black Forest. We go to a bear and wolf sanctuary. We go to Freiburg this time. So it's a, a different place we're going. We still go to Basel. And, um, and it's a fabulous trip. So you can join us for that. And we will talk about Alsace another time and other regions in France in terms of what you can find vegan. But 
you know, the reason we do this Alsace trip and the reason we do the Dordogne trip is because these are not regions that are vegan friendly, especially Alsace, especially in the winter time at Christmas time. It really is all just meat. And especially because it's very Germanic, it's very meaty. And so we really pride ourselves on being able to give you everything you want and not having to sacrifice and, and, and not get Alsatian cuisine just because you're vegan. So that's what that trip is all about. Now, once Bridie and Seb left, David and I had three more full days in Bordeaux, and we considered going to the left bank. We, we were going to do it. We were kind of back and forth about it because, again, the train was easy, but it still required us to kind of figure things out and have a specific time. And to be honest, we were still decompressing after this, after our group trip, and we wanted to just not have things to do. I know I was really looking forward to just like not having a plan, <laughs> just not having to follow a schedule, not having to follow an itinerary. And so also we just wanted to see Bordeaux. It's an incredible city with a fantastic history, a very long history, and it was the right choice for us. And that also meant we had the opportunity to check out lots more vegan and vegan friendly options. And when I say vegan options, meaning vegan restaurants, there are only two all vegan restaurants. That's Monkey Mood, which I already raved about, and a restaurant called D Lure. That's D-I-S is the first word, and L-E-U-R is the second word, D Lure. And we decided to go to that second restaurant, D Lure, that night, we passed it by, we went by, David had already heard about it, and we decided to make a reservation. Now, there are other vegan, vegetarian places that we didn't go to. Dirty Vegan Burgers by Taster, I think it does not have a brick and mortar store, but I did see that when I was looking at vegan options, and I think it's all, like Uber Eats, it's all deliverable. But it's all vegan burgers, you know, mostly beyond burgers, but it looked great. And so we didn't eat there, but that is an option. So it's called Dirty Vegan Burgers. And then there is a vegetarian place. It's all like lots of vegan options, but all vegetarian. It's mostly, um, it's buffet style. So it's more casual. And that's called La Cuisine de Laine. So of Helen, H E L E N E. So La Cuisine de Laine. And I will also include that, but we didn't go, so we can't speak to it. So I've already talked about Monkey Mood. Now let's talk about D. Lure. David had heard about this place. He had it on his radar. So glad we made reservations because the place is small and it was packed. And it was really lovely to see people were trying to get in there. And it was actually really funny because David had left a message that he wanted to make a reservation. They called back, but I think we missed it. But I think they emailed him and, and kind of confirmed it. But when we got there, she said, oh, I left a message for you you know, basically insinuating that the the reservation hadn't been confirmed. And he was like, well, you emailed me, you confirmed it. So it was actually fine. They gave us the option to either sit downstairs or outside. Now, the main dining room was already booked. The outside had only one table, like a cocktail table, kind of a high, high top. And the downstairs was it, you know, it's, it kind of reminded me of like a wine cellar. It was really cute, had like twinkling twinkling white lights and it was pretty, but there's no windows and I really prefer being outside and luckily we were the only table so there were no smokers and <laughs> we sat at that table outside and I'm really glad we did. The staff was absolutely lovely, also spoke English, though I will tell you my tip for how I got around. In a French speaking country, once Bridie and Seb, the French speakers, left, I will tell you my tip from the hip, but we really appreciated she spoke English and we were able to communicate because I had lots of questions for her about this restaurant because it was this a little fancier. They focus on tapas. In the summer, they focus specifically on tapas. But apparently after the summer, they have a kind of limited menu. But if you look online, I saw like fish and chips like tofu fish and chips kind of thing and some other main dishes. But in the summer, it's tapas. And it was really lovely. So you can order individual dishes or you can order the sharing plate. We ordered the sharing plate for two. There was also an additional plate of barbecue seitan, which we got <laughs> in addition to the sharing plate. And we got the cheese plate and we got dessert. Yes, I wanted all of these things because I wanted the whole experience. And I wanted to be able to share this with you. I did it for you. I did it for you. And it does sound like a lot of food. And it wasn't light food because, again, there were some fried things. 
but it, it because it was tapas, it wasn't a ton of all of this food. I wasn't getting overly full, even though, yeah, yeah, we ordered like the entire menu. So, so the sharing plate consisted of onion rings and French fries and breadsticks with a nice bean dip, cashew cream stuffed uh, peppers, and a really lovely gazpacho. They were all very tasty. I have pictures and videos, and I will share them with you. And again, that's going to be over at joyfulvegan.com. The cheese plate was probably my favorite. I wasn't a big cheese person before I became vegan. This was now 24 years ago, but I became one a bit more as cheese started getting better. I can't say I'm still a cheese person, but especially in France, having spent a lot of time there and having spent a lot of time there over the years, especially recently, and knowing that a course as part of a meal is a cheese course, I've come to really appreciate it. And now that there are so many purveyors making really good cheese, really good plant-based cheeses, I have come to appreciate it. And so the cheese plate was fantastic. And I asked if it was house made and she said, no, it wasn't house made. It was friends of theirs who are in Brittany. And so I looked them up. I've since looked them up. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly because there's a T and an apostrophe and YK and it might be a it might be a dialect, but it's Teak Affinage. And they are in Brittany, and we have some very good friends who just moved to Brittany. So we will be going to Brittany sometime soon, and I can't wait to go there and actually maybe visit the plant. But the cheeses were absolutely delicious. They're cashew-based. And I did look them up, and they are doing so many wonderful things in terms of sustainability and waste reduction. And so they're just ticking all the boxes of being a really ethical company. So not only were their cheeses delicious, but they're they're doing all the right things. They, uh, as part of the cheese plate, there was one that was reminded me of a brie and one that was more of like a blue cheese. And they were absolutely fabulous. So we had that. And then we had dessert. And the dessert plate consisted of a few different things. I can't quite remember everything. I think there was something that were like stuffed dates, which were really lovely maybe with some balsamic, and I can't remember the other thing, but one of the things that was really special was there was a cannelé. So cannelé is a very well-known pastry, especially in Bordeaux. And it was something that Brady was pointing out to me. I had seen it. I wasn't really familiar with it. I hadn't had it because this is this is something very regional. And I was not a Francophile growing up and I didn't eat these kinds of pastries growing up. And then when I became vegan, this is just not something you see as a vegan item on many dessert menus because it's so specific to this region. But as I started, you know, I spend any time in Bordeaux, you see Canelle shops everywhere you go. And what it is, is a pastry that has a very distinctive cylindrical shape. It has like a caramelized crust and it has a soft custard interior. They're not vegan, not even close to being vegan. And in fact, what's really interesting is Canelle's, the history of them dates back to when wine, because wine has been part of this region for so long, they would use the egg whites, which is not used very often these days, but they would use the egg whites to you know basically filter the wine if you will and they had the yolks left over and so they wanted to be able to use the yolks and in order to do that they came up with this dish this pastry that was mostly basically egg yolks and flour and i think milk and basically it was like a bread but as colonization increased and they started getting these imports of new world products through slavery, um, like rum, like sugar, like vanilla, they then changed the recipe and made what are now known as canelles. And they are basically what I described, this kind of caramelized outside crust it looks like a little cake and, and and it is more of a cake. It's not a it's not a bread now with the with the vanilla and the rum and the sugar it's more of a cake and uh custardy and very custardy inside well it was pretty fun to be able to have a canelle because i wouldn't have had it otherwise obviously and i wouldn't have cared it would have been fine to go about my life without a canelle but it was really lovely to be able to have that and we had that at Dilor because they serve it as one of their desserts and canelle comes from uh, the word for cinnamon, means cinnamon, because there was an early use of cinnamon in this recipe. So that's uh, the restaurant we ate at. It was absolutely lovely. I highly recommend this place. I will put it on the show notes for Bordeaux, vegan in Bordeaux. 
and they were absolutely lovely. Would love to go back sometime when it's not the tapas and just try some other things, but if you go, let me know. So we have lots more to say about vegan in Bordeaux, but first let's take a quick break to thank supporters. I'm just gonna go through this a little more generally than I usually do because there's been a real decrease in support and I just really want to emphasize that my work hasn't stopped it hasn't slowed down I'm doing these podcasts I'm doing all of the work to spread the word about veganism as much as I can in this world and you have made it possible for me to do so and at this point I'm kind of rethinking how we're going to be able to support this because things have changed so much and I think people are just used to maybe now people like me being quote-unquote influencers and making money from products from product companies, you know, basically paying their way. I don't have that model. I haven't had that model since I started. It's always been a model where I uh, rely on listener support, but maybe it makes more sense to do a membership model where, you know, there is content that only members members get. I'm not really sure. I don't really have the bandwidth to change my entire model, but I just want to really emphasize that if you're listening to this podcast, have ever gotten anything out of it, want it to continue, if you have $5 a month, if you have $10 a month or whatever you can spare, I really encourage you to become a sponsor. I keep saying that I can go out and get sponsors and and monetize it, but I just I just don't have the bandwidth to do it. And I'd rather not. I'd rather just really keep this model. But if you don't think that I should keep this model and you think I should go and get sponsors, then uh, then I might need to to really consider that. So go to joyfulvegan.com slash donate or just joyfulvegan.com. You can see the donate button or go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau and become a supporter today. Okay, let's talk about some non-vegan restaurants we ate at where we had a very easy time finding options. And I said before that when you're in a city... I don't care what country you're in. Cities are much easier to find just lots of options because there's going to be a variety of international cuisine, right? And Bordeaux is nothing if not an international city. It's an incredibly diverse city, not surprisingly being a port town, but it has a slew of international restaurants and we took advantage of many of them because we had many meals. We had many meals we had to eat being there for for so many days. So first and foremost, we went to a Japanese restaurant. It was just around the corner from the little boutique hotel. We we stayed in a second hotel, which actually turned out really well. We had to move hotels because, the again, the uh, World Cup was so was overrunning the city and all the hotel rooms were taken up. So we couldn't stay in that first hotel four nights. We had to split. And we went to a different part of the city, which actually turned out to be a good thing because we got to see... Uh, a different area of the city and spend time in this other area, which I really preferred was the historic area. And that meant by the time we left, we really saw a lot of Bordeaux and I was really happy about that. So the Japanese restaurant, I'll put on the show notes, it was called Les Chops à Sushi, Les Chops à Poké. So it was sushi and pokey. And I have to tell you that I have never seen more pokey places than this trip to France. <laughs> I have not been on the pokey bandwagon didn't really know much about it sure heard heard of poke but i yeah, i know it's, i know it's hawaiian that's about all i know but oh my god in paris and bordeaux but mostly paris i think every other restaurant was a pokey place and i know that means there's lots of vegan friendly you know items but i just i don't know i just pokey just wasn't on my radar so i was just shocked at how many pokey places there were and this place kind of had poke bowls and sushi and some vietnamese dishes as well we had looked it up online beforehand, so we knew it was very vegan friendly and I really liked it. It was really good. We were going to sit outside, but I have to tell you, you know, I really love being in Europe, but one of the things I do not like about European life is the smoking. I'm someone who spends all my time outside, working, eating, walking, hiking. Every minute of my day is outside. And, uh, and oh my God, since I've been home, I've been out like eating outside at restaurants. It is so nice to be outside on a terrace and not have people smoking. And I say this as an ex-smoker. I know I can say, you know, it's just so horrible to want to just eat and just having people smoke. When you're walking down the street, people are walking. Even when I smoked, I did not walk down the street and smoke because you just don't know who the smoke is hitting. So anyway, I sound arrogant as an ex-smoker, but it's just not pleasant at all. So the number of times I ate inside when we were in France, because we couldn't be outside because of the smoking, was a lot, a lot more than I normally would. There was a whole terrace outside, but there was two, there were two people smoking. 
So we ate inside and it actually turned out well because it was kind of raining off and on, <laughs> even though there was a canopy, so we could have eaten outside if the smokers weren't there. But uh, it was a cute little place, really enjoyed it. David had a poke bowl with tofu, and because their menu is Vietnamese-influenced, I had the boban, which was delicious, like rice noodles and veggies and tofu and peanuts and mint, and they confirmed everything didn't, they confirmed that everything we got didn't have fish sauce. We ordered some uh, little uh, sushi rolls as well. Really good place, highly recommend it. We spent the day getting familiar with Bordeaux and it was lovely because now I'm starting to get a better sense of Bordeaux. It rained, which cooled things off. Now we're staying in a cute hotel. It felt really clean. There was some air conditioning when we got there. You know, things were starting to take a turn and we were starting to really appreciate Bordeaux. And as I said, you know, the history there is just incredible. One of the cathedrals we went to was where Eleanor of Aquitaine was married to Louis VII, which really started the entire relationship between France and English in England, especially in relation to the Hundred Years' War. And so it was it was a really beautiful city and we wound up really liking it. And I'm really glad I had a new experience because I was um, not happy with Bordeaux when we first when we first got there. And I promised I would tell you about how I communicated with locals, even though I don't speak French. And it's kind of a joke with my friends. I'm saying this because I'm defending myself a little bit. We all have a place that we feel really attached to. We all have places we feel attached to. We have places that we don't feel attached to. And I am not a Francophile. I'm just, I've never loved the language. I I like, I, some of my favorite movies are French movies, uh, but I'm not a huge, you know, fan of French cuisine, especially being vegan as long as I have, as I became more of a person interested in food, of course, by that time, you know, there's not a lot of French cuisine that is vegan friendly. So that wasn't on my radar. Yeah, I like their baguettes. What else can I say? I mean, just even the history, I've always been more interested in um, British history. So I'm more of an Anglophile in the historical sense. Literature, same thing. I wasn't always really interested in French literature, it would be more British English literature. And and then, you know, as far as language, it's Italy. As far as food, it's Italy. And so there's all these things that just really draw me to a particular place. And that place happens to be Italy uh, when we're talking about European history and European food and language. France is just not one of those places. But it was really nice to be there this time because I'll talk about it in another episode. I really did wind up falling in love with the Dordogne. It doesn't mean... Everyone kept saying, David kept saying, and Bredin said, so... Dordogne or Italy, you know, Dordogne or Tuscany, because I was starting to say, like, I like the Dordogne, I really like it. And the, the it's not the right question. The question isn't Dordogne or Tuscany. I'm not going to choose the Dordogne over Tuscany. It's just not going to happen. But as far as all the regions we've been to in France, and we've been in Provence, we've been in Normandy, we've been in Champagne, we've been in uh, Alsace, we've been in Paris, we've been to many parts of France, I can say that the Dordogne was was my favorite part of is my favorite part of France now. But as far as Bordeaux, you know, same thing. I, you know, I'm not going to run to go back there anytime soon, but I really did like it. And the joke that I was making when I knew that Brighty and Seb were going to be leaving and we weren't going to have, you know, our French speakers with us, I said, I'm just going to speak Italian. And guess what? I did. And oh my God, I was able to speak to so many people. So when we got into the Uber, for instance, when we were leaving that awful apartment and getting to our first hotel, I started, I, you know, I do it very naturally when I'm in Europe because I'm used to English not being the first language, obviously. And so when they would ask either in English or in French if we spoke French, I would say, no, parlo italiano. And I would say, I speak Italian in Italian. And that first Uber driver, he also spoke Italian. He was from Tunisia, but he had spent time in Italy. And of course, being in Tunisia and then now living in Bordeaux, he spoke French, but he also spoke Italian. So that 20, 25 minute ride, there's a lot of traffic. We, um, because did I mention Rugby World Cup? We, um, we spoke Italian the whole time and it was lovely because I had been, you know, meaning to get back to my Italian and it kind of got me right back to my Italian and I was really, really happy about that. And then several other times after that, whenever I would encounter someone, I just said at this point, just said, forget it. If they don't speak English, then uh, I will just speak Italian and hope that gets me through. And it did. So there were lots of other times that I, um, that we were able, that I was able to speak Italian. And I will say this, you know, 
I know there's stereotypes about French and how they treat Americans and how they treat English speakers. I, I'll be really honest. I have not had that experience. And I don't know if it's because we're sheltered a bit because we're in these group trips. And most of our time in France has been part of the group trips or with Bridie and Seb. And they speak French. And, you know, when we were in Provence for a week, we were there together. The four of us, we rented an Airbnb. But every restaurant or person or hotel that I've ever communicated with, being an English speaker, I have never found them to be hostile to my being an English speaker. But I will say one thing that I do do when I am talking to, when I need to talk to someone, and, you know, we need to find a way to communicate. I do not presume they speak English. The whole time on this trip, when I would have to communicate with someone, I would ask them if they spoke English. And that always, I think, enamors I'll say French people to English speakers because they, they that I think is their problem is that they just presume is the problem they have with English speakers is the presumption that French speakers speak English. And so I think it's a courtesy in a country where French is obviously the primary language and a protected language at that a very, you know, a, a very uh, preserved language. Uh, just don't presume just ask if they speak English. But otherwise, they, I just, they, everyone was lovely. But by the time I started speaking Italian, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm doing. And it was great because <laughs> the next place we ate at that was so good, and I will include this place, was an Italian place. We were in the mood for pizza that next night, and we looked online for a pizza place in the area we were going to be in. And we walked by. It was kind of early. It was around 630, which is very early for, you know, European dinners, and I know that's very American of me, but I do like to eat early, and we did eat late a lot, and this was 6.30, and we were hungry, so there, was, there weren't any other diners there, there weren't any other patrons, but there were about like seven people outside who appeared to be workers, like staff, and I could hear them speaking Italian. So I was like, let's go here. The, like, the, the, the photos look good. The reviews were good. And I'm, I can, they're, they're speaking Italian. It had pizza napolitana on the side of the, of the building. And it just looked really cute and quaint. And so I started speaking Italian. So when I went up to them and said a table for two, you know, can we have dinner for a table for two? I said it in Italian. And it was really lovely because immediately they started speaking back to me in Italian. And we were having a conversation. And one of the guys said, you're Italian is perfect your accent is perfect I was like thank you <laughs> so it was really fun and the pizza was really good and the wine was fantastic it was all Italian wine so I was at home I felt very much at home and then after pizza, of course, I wanted gelato. Now, I've already talked at length about gelato in episodes about Italy, and there's lots to say. You can go listen to those episodes. But in France, there are gelateria. There are, um, you know, ice cream places. In France, they're going to be called, you know, it's, it's, ice cream is called glace, G-L-A-C-E-S. And uh, it's not gelato. But there is an international gelato chain called Amarino, Amarino. And it's known for its like rose-shaped gelato. That that's how they kind of scoop it into the cone. Anyway, we had already gone to one in Paris, and then David and I had taken a trip to Rouen um, before our French countryside trip started. So they had an amarino there, and I had some gelato there, and then there was one in Bordeaux, probably more than one to be honest. And they had a ton of vegan options. But what was funny was the most of the vegan options were sorbet. And, you know, if I'm going to have ice cream, I want ice cream. I want gelato. I don't want sorbet. But I tasted their chocolate, and it was so good. It was so creamy. And I wound up continuing to get that each time. So my favorite combination of ice cream, especially in uh, in Italy, is uh, chocolate and strawberry. And so that's what I kept getting when I went to Amarino. So we went to Amarino. But there was another time I wanted gelato, and we were sitting in this little square in Bordeaux. I'll put this square. There's some really beautiful squares. There's so many beautiful squares in in Bordeaux. So we were at this little square. It was during a downpour. It was during the rain the day before. We were you know, covered by an awning. We were looking at a 12th century church and I saw a gelato place, um, you know, glacé across the way. So I went there to go look to see if there were any vegan options. And it was like this very pretty artisan local ice cream place. And I asked the woman in my broken English, uh, French, and she answered me in her broken English. I asked if every, anything was vegan and she told me everything that was. And she said that the cones are vegan as well. So she was very keen on on making sure I got what I needed and I said, I'll be back because I needed to finish my wine. 
And then um, we went back and I got some chocolate and strawberry. So just, you know, take a look at places you go to, ask. Uh, you'd be surprised to see how many places do say vegan, even in France, even though it's not like a no Italian gelateria, but we found plenty. And, and then... And then what? And then what? The next day was our last day, and it was actually the day we were leaving, but we had all day to spend in, in Bordeaux before we had to take um, a flight from Bordeaux to Paris, and then we were staying overnight in Paris at a hotel at the airport and then flying home. And so we decided to do a walking tour, definitely something I highly recommend wherever you go, whatever city you're in. It was free. There were some paid ones, but we chose this one, obviously tipped her, and the guide was fantastic. I'll put her name. She was quite good. I was really impressed. She's not even French. She's she's Colombian and she's been in Bordeaux for two years, but she had so much knowledge and so much enthusiasm and passion for Bordeaux. And, um, and we really enjoyed it. And the best tip we got from her <laughs> was at the very end, she pointed to the um, wine school. So Ecole uh, des Vins, right across the square from where we were, we were at this, like the square where like the, um, Intercontinental is there. It's this, you know, the, the the opera and the theater is there. It's this really beautiful square. You can't miss it. And the wine school is right there. And she said, because there's students there, they're training there to be, you know, winemakers, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, if you want the most economical glasses of wine, there's a wine bar inside the school, go. And we were like, okay. So we went to lunch and I'll tell you about that to wrap it up. And after lunch, we went to Ecole de Vin and like when you're in Europe, you're already paying a lot less for a glass of wine than you would in the United States. I don't care. Anywhere in the United States and especially California where I live, you know, we go to a restaurant. It's $15 for a glass of wine, right? The wine typically in European restaurants, Italian, France, whatever, French, whatever, uh, six six bucks, seven bucks, right? Like just, you know, good wine, but like a lot less expensive. The wine glasses were $2, $3. And these are like Bordeaux wines. Like <laughs> they were really good wines. And um, tip from the hip, go there. I'll put that on the list as well. And as we were, you know, doing that walking tour, we had passed another pizza place on the tour and I kind of made a note of it. It looked authentic and it was. It was an osteria and pizzeria. And so we decided to go back there after our tour was over and then go to the wine place, which we did afterwards. And um, had really good pizza there. Also practiced my Italian. So when in France, eat at Italian restaurants. I don't know what to tell you, but but truly there were lovely places in Bordeaux. We really wound up liking Bordeaux. I'm really glad we got to spend the time there that we did. And I'm not kidding when I say that I loved the Dordogne so much that I have informed Bridie and Seb that I would host another joyful vegan trip there and we'll do it in 2025. So if you're interested in all, I know I haven't talked about the Dordogne at all, <laughs> but a little bit. Uh, it was fab fabulous and fantastic and beautiful and incredible. And the prehistoric caves that I was so excited to see, they were beyond, beyond amazing. So I was more excited about that than anything else. And, and it definitely uh, exceeded my expectations. So I'll talk more about the Dordogne another time. But I hope you enjoyed this episode on Vegan in Bordeaux. I hope to see you on one of our joyful vegan trips. We've got Japan. We've got one spot left for Japan too. As of this recording, we've got spots for Alsace. I think I said we had two. And then we do have our Tuscany and French uh, and our uh, Northern Italy trips in June. And we've got Rwanda. And those are filling up. So don't hesitate to go over to joyfulveganTrips.com and join me somewhere around the world, enjoying amazing cuisine wherever we go and celebrating animal protection work wherever we go. And in the meantime, you can also go to joyfulvegan.com. You can check out my books. I'm selling them directly. You can check out my on-demand classes. I've got hundreds of recipes. And of course, I do one on one consultations. So you can book me for one of those. So joyfulvegan.com for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thanks for listening, everyone. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.